Artemis 1, the most powerful rocket in history. Its 42-day unmanned mission, explore reaches of the moon, but not land there and then return to Earth. Sounds a little familiar. The last time we went to the moon, over 50 years ago, was to settle a family feud between nations during the Cold War. A race to culturally determine one to be more impressive than the other, somehow relating national pride to national protection. In 2024 and 2025, we'll be sending people there again, but not just to set foot on the moon and plant a silly flag, but to build a permanent base there. But why? What separates the seemingly pointless purposes of then and the apparently purposeful reasons of now? What is there to gain from building structures on the surface of a sparse and secluded natural satellite? We think that there are enough resources on the moon to perform something called in situ resource utilization, or in other words, to manufacture buildings and equipment using the moon's own resources, which makes things easier. Rocket science is a matter of mass conversion. Contrary to what Neil Armstrong believes, the first giant leap for mankind is getting off Earth. In order to do so, you need to be traveling at speeds roughly 8,000 meters a second. The heavier your object is, the more thrust it requires to get up to this speed, which means it needs more fuel so it can burn for longer and thus is even heavier, leading to a pretty circular thought process. Without dragging equations and maths into it, of all the fuel types we have access to as a spacefaring civilization, the rockets that use them need to have at least 80% of their masses be fuel. Any lower than that and the rocket will come violently tumbling back to Earth because it just can't accelerate fast enough against Earth's gravity with all that added weight. Here's an even more extreme example. A Coke can is 94% Coke, 6% can in terms of mass. The fuel tanks on rockets are 96% fuel, 4% tank. A rocket's fuel tank is, relatively speaking, thinner than a Coke can. Whilst air resistance and inertia play into it, the real problem is gravity. Let's think of it like a car. If we were driving our rocket, so to speak, to Mars, a 480 million kilometer journey, and we were looking at our fuel gauge, thinking about when we might need to stop off at the nearest interplanetary gas station, we'd probably get quite worried quite fast. Getting just 400 kilometers above the ground, a millionth of the distance requires 50% of the energy needed to go to the surface of Mars. That is how intense our gravity is when it comes to rocket science. So adding weight to our rocket in the form of building materials, floorboards, windows and bricks is pretty much out of the question. There's no way we would get to the moon with a payload that heavy. So wherever we go, we need to make sure that we can use the materials available to us when we arrive, not when we unpack. But we need somewhere to start, right? We can't just land on the moon and live out of our spacesuits for the weeks it takes to build our first house, which is why we'll probably be taking inflatable structures with us to start off with. Yep, the first people living on the moon will be living in a bouncy castle. The next problem is power. How are we going to power these new buildings and machines if we can't bring batteries with us? Well, fortunately, the lunar soil is full of metals and materials. In fact, it's got almost everything we could possibly need to build solar panels. A massive misconception that seems to seep its way into Hollywood movies is the idea of the dark side of the moon. There isn't a dark side of the moon. The side of the moon we can't see gets exactly the same amount of light as the side we can see. The reason this fallacy exists is because the moon is tidally locked with our planet. That is, it doesn't rotate on its axis as it orbits around us, and so we always see the same face. But that also means that the day-night cycle for the moon is long, 354 hours long. That's great for the lunar daytime, 354 hours of power, but not so great for the nighttime, which is why these Artemis missions are focused around the lunar south pole. There, a base could enjoy permanent sunlight, aside from the rare and short lunar eclipses, all year round. Using that power, European scientists have already developed a technique to 3D print bricks from the lunar soil using just solar power, and not too dissimilar to the stereotypical buildings on our own South Pole, build a lunar igloo. 
Next on the lunar checklist is oxygen. We need oxygen to breathe. The lunar soil itself is conveniently 42% frozen oxygen, which we could harvest using simple heat and electricity, which is helpful. And even more conveniently, aside from the permanent solar energy, there's also a lot of frozen water at the lunar south pole. This is probably the most integral resource needed for going to the moon, but probably not for the reason you think. One of those fuel types I was talking about earlier is called hydrogen oxygen fuel. A rocket engine uses combustion, a process which requires oxygen to function, and this is what makes the rocket very heavy. Jet engines use the oxygen in the atmosphere to burn their fuel, but when you're in space, and I'm not sure how much of a surprise this will be, there isn't any oxygen. You need to bring oxygen into space so that the fuel you bring with you actually ignites. If you've ever put a poker in a fire pit, you'll have seen metal that's glowing white hot. Surprisingly, this is almost exactly what fire is as well. Instead of it being white hot glowing metal, think of it as white hot glowing gas. The reaction gives so much energy to the particles that are burning that their gaseous states sort of glow. And this is no different to the fiery trails rockets leave behind. The way that rockets propel themselves is by pushing gases out their rear end. It's the pressure of this gas, which we see as fire, that propels them upward. Let's think of it another way. If you had intestines big enough and with very thick walls, providing the pressure in your backside was large enough, you could propel yourself to the moon by farting the gases out your bumhole. So using hydrogen oxygen fuel, the gases that you're using to propel yourself through the void are literally water. It's a weird thing to imagine using water as fire, but it's what happens. The product of this reaction is a release of water vapor. This process is also reversible. Another weird truth about rocket science is that you can take water and turn it into rocket fuel. The water on the moon, by extension, can be synthesized into oxygen and hydrogen, then liquefied and used as rocket fuel. This will be genuinely one of the biggest leaps for humankind in terms of space travel. It means when you want to launch a rocket from Earth to another planet, you no longer need to bring all of the fuel for your journey with you. You can just stop off at the moon, pick up a Mars bar and a scratch card, and refuel your spaceship. The moon is literally an interplanetary gas station. This means that rocket ships can be much smaller, lighter and cheaper. The moon, in fact, is a leaping off point for Mars. It means that we only ever have to design spaceships that can go as far as the moon to allow our species to travel to the ends of our solar system. But that's going to the moon and beyond. So what about the other way round? The moon is worth 25 quadrillion dollars. That is a lot of cheese. Among the resources on the moon, like water, iron and magnesium, is a very special component, helium-3. Nuclear fission, which is what we use to generate power in nuclear power plants at the moment, is the most efficient way to make power, period. Better than coal, oil and gas combined. But despite the fact that it doesn't contribute greenhouse gases to our atmosphere, it isn't exactly clean energy. The byproduct of nuclear fission reactions are radioactive, which is dangerous and needs to be stored effectively indefinitely. Whereas fission splits atoms to make power, fusion merges atoms into larger ones to make energy and doesn't leave behind any radioactive waste products. Fusion is what power is the heart of our sun. You might think that it's science fiction to build one here, like having our own pocket-sized micro sun, and that we're really far away from it, but actually, it's already been done. A lot. The problem with fusion at the moment isn't understanding the science, it's generating more energy than it costs to run it. At the moment, we use tritium and deuterium in our fusion reactions, both of which are just isotopes of hydrogen. But the problem with that is that when these elements merge, the product of their reaction is a loss of neutrons. Losing these neutrons means a lot of lost energy. And in order to perform fusion, you need to make a chamber of plasma, which is really energy intensive. Not only that, but these lost neutrons can then spiral off and create radioactive elements 
elements with the surrounding matter, which means that we're back to the same problem as before, creating radioactive waste we need to store indefinitely. But helium-3 fusion doesn't lose neutrons at all. That means no energy lost and no radioactive waste. But helium-3 is generated by the sun's radiation, something our planet kindly protects us from with our magnetosphere and our atmosphere. So there's basically zero helium-3 on Earth. Whereas getting to the moon is one of the biggest steps for humankind in space travel, getting helium-3 back from the moon would be one of the biggest leaps for humankind in terms of energy generation. According to some estimates, there's enough helium-3 on the moon to power the United States alone for 80,000 years. But therein lies the problem. How in the world can we get helium-3 back from the moon? There are a lot of ways, actually, but my favorite by far is a space catapult. You might think that I'm chatting nonsense, but actually, space catapults already exist on Earth today. The company Spin Launch uses circular chambers that spin at ridiculously high speeds before catapulting small satellites into low orbit without using rockets. But for the moon, calling it a space catapult is a little unscientific. It's more like a space crossbow. In reality, it's called a mass driver. You know those spectacular maglev trains in Japan, South Korea, China and somehow Disneyland? Yeah, a mass driver is one of those. The moon's gravity is actually so weak that you don't even need rockets to reach escape velocity. Effectively, you'd attach a payload to a small maglev train on a very long rail. You'd then speed it up to extreme speeds and let it fly off the end. Because it's moving so fast, it would escape the gravitational pull of the moon and fall into the gravitational pull of the Earth. It's obviously a lot more specific and complicated than that. You don't want to send an artificial asteroid just anywhere. There's a lot of calculations to make sure that it lands in a very particular place. But this would be an extremely low-cost method of sending stuff back to the Earth from the Moon. In fact, you could send many of these payloads back a second. Whereas the original space race was literally a penis measuring contest between America and Russia, a pawn in the Cold War, the next space race over the coming decades will likely again be for the moon in a far more purposeful way. But all this talk of fusion and space catapults isn't important to me. The only mass I want to drive is yours toward mine as we merge for a great big hug. Thanks for watching.